uh, thank you so much to, for having me today. Um, thanks to Joe and the Designers and Geeks team and to Yelp. Uh, thanks for having vegan pizza, that's super awesome. Um, so I'm gonna, my name is Clara and I'm gonna talk to you about responsible AI. So what it is, what it means, and how we can use UX to make it happen. Um, can everyone hear me, by the way, especially people in the back? Good, okay, perfect. If you miss something, just wave and I'll, I'll do something about that. Uh, okay, so um, I work at Bonsai, which is an AI platform company over in Berkeley in the East Bay. And we build tools to help software developers, data scientists, and engineers make AI from scratch. Um, so we are building a series of tools to help people solve different kinds of AI problems. And actually, we're looking for people to try them out and be part of these research studies. So if you're a software engineer, data scientist, other kind of engineer, and that interests you, definitely find me afterwards or send me an email. It's up there. Um, I also co-organize Ladies at UX San Francisco, which is a monthly meetup here in the city that has UX uh, training programs and different kinds of workshops on how to be a, do different kinds of UX things and how to level up your career. Um, so ask me about that if you're interested as well. Um, I also want to share a little bit about why I'm going to talk about ethics tonight. So I became interested in AI and ethics through my work at Bonsai. A big part of my job, especially when I started out there, was to understand how people think about AI, what they think it does, is it harmful, is it helpful, um, and how we can apply some of the garden variety design and research methods that many of us use every day to solving some of the prevailing issues in AI, especially when you think about who uses it and how it affects them. So I'd like to share some of my thoughts on that with you tonight, and I'd love to chat with anybody who's thinking about the same kinds of problems or is interested in working in those spaces. Okay. Uh, the other thing I wanted to just call out is that I'm gonna use AI as a catch-all term for anything vaguely related to artificial intelligence. This may include some things that technically fall under the machine learning umbrella, and I'm gonna do this in part because that's how most of your users are gonna be thinking about it. So I just wanted to call that out to begin. But while we're talking about language, uh, let's ask, what is AI? I asked Google this question, and, I, and Google gave me answers. Um, for those of you in the back, some of the more interesting ones are, AI is the new electricity, AI is eating software, AI is good, AI is the future, AI is scary, AI is taking over, and AI is overhyped. So it turns out Google doesn't just think this. I also asked some other people, and they gave me a bunch of similar words. Um, some of the highlights here are that it's unethical, it's biased, AI is killer robots, <laughs> AI is the future, and AI is cool, and AI is creepy. So this is interesting. Clearly there are a lot of conflicting thoughts. Some people think AI is really cool, and some people think it's really creepy. So what is it? Why are we seeing this dichotomy? Well, let's take a look at some examples. So last week at I.O., Google demoed Google Duplex, which is a system that tags on to Google Assistant, OK Google, which many of you may have on your phones, um, and actually uses AI to make phone calls. But the catch here is that it's not any phone calls. It's not just a robot calling. It's a robot that sounds like a human, down to lexical features like like and um and like uh, that we insert into our speech. And it sounds extremely realistic to the extent that it's difficult, if not impossible, to differentiate it from a real human voice. So as you can imagine, this received a variety of reactions. Some people thought that it was really scary and it was a sign of something terrible to come. And they were really upset that they felt that they were gonna be tricked into thinking they were speaking with a real person when really they were talking to a robot. Other people were overjoyed and really saw the benefit of a tool like this and were excited about the advances that it implied for the AI industry. And others were on the fence. They said they don't, like this tweet up here, I don't know if I'm more excited to use Google Duplex or nervous for humankind. So AI can be both cool and creepy. To further this point, let's look at another example, and this is where we're gonna have some more AV fun. Um, at the robotics company Boston Dynamics over in my hometown of Boston, um, 
this, this happened. Uh, we might not be getting sound. All right, just imagine Jingle Bells playing. <laughs> Uh, this is a Christmas video um, in December 2015. So those are Boston Dynamics robots, and you have someone dressed up as Mrs. Claus uh, who's waving to you. So uh, as as you can imagine, um, and if you've seen any any of other boss uh, eh, any other of Boston Dynamics videos, um, you'll know that Boston Dynamics products are hailed equally as super interesting and exciting, and they're also denounced as Harbinges are doom, or terrifying robots that will destroy us all. So again, we know now, and now my AV is just not happening. Um, oh, we're getting, okay. Let's try this again. All right, yes, the robots are taking over. Uh, they didn't want us to move on, uh, but we, we actually prevailed. So we know that AI can be both cool and creepy. Um, but actually, this isn't great. Because as technologists, our job isn't to make really creepy things. Our job is to make things that are just cool and exciting and fun and interesting to use and don't threaten our users. So how are we going to solve this problem? Oh. OK, cool. Um, if we have time, we can go listen to that video again with, with the sound. It really, really makes it. Um, so. It turns out that, to really get at the heart of this, it turns out that AI, uh, that rather the creepiness isn't the only issue that faces AI. AI is also often applied in problematic ways. So let's look at some more examples. Let's see if I can get this working. So AI, for example, is increasingly being used in the criminal justice system, including in sentencing and parole. Um, as studies like this one from ProPublica has shown, the models themselves can have bias, leading to devastating consequences for individuals, families, and their communities. And this is especially true for groups that are already very marginalized, like people of color and particularly black people. So th this is very disturbing. So how does this bias come about? Well, one way is through biased data sets, where the data used to train the AI aren't representative of the populations who are actually using the product. That's presumably what happened here. A person took a passport photo and uploaded it to the website, and the website said that their eyes were closed, so the photo was rejected. But that's obviously not the case. So we know that AI shouldn't be creepy, and it needs to use representative data. That is, do not rely on biased data sets. So what does it mean for AI to be responsible and therefore avoid these problems? There are a lot of definitions, but the one I'm going to use is that responsible AI incorporates people's values and concerns, uses representative data, and aims to eliminate bias. This definition can also encapsulate other concepts, like being transparent about how AI is learning and making decisions. So how do you go about doing this and enacting it? Well, you can actually just use a regular design process that if you're a designer or a researcher, or anybody else who works with design and research, you're probably familiar with. So the process that many of us undertake goes roughly like this. You start in a discovery phase where you're trying to figure out the problem space that you're in and why you're doing this. You explore potential solutions and you try to figure out how are people going to use these potential solutions that you're coming up with. And then you pick a solution and you, and you evaluate it. And you might go through this a couple times, maybe the entire process or just specific parts of it as necessary. So that's what we'll do today. So let's imagine that we're going to design a smart assistant app. So this is an app that you have on your phone, and you can talk to it. And it also has a UI that shows you things and tells you things, too. So the first step will start in the discovery phase. You want to begin by understanding the context. Technology doesn't exist in isolation. There's a rich social and environmental context that you'll need to understand if you want your product to succeed. Because this, these contexts play a massive role in how people will be engaging with your product. So to start doing that, you can go out, watch people, do interviews and surveys, and ask a lot of questions to investigate the space. Let's imagine you want to build a Spartan assistant. Well, who are you building it for, and what are they doing? What are their needs and wants and values? 
How are they using similar products, if at all, and what gaps will yours fill? What kinds of features, you can then ask, should your product have? So doing this contextual inquiry can really drive some of these questions. And again, if you're a researcher, this is familiar to you. So you can definitely apply it in, this kind of, in these kinds of circumstances. But as you're doing this, it's also really important to think inclusively. How will the AI behave for different kinds of people? If we're creating a system that has a voice-activated component, so you're going to be talking to this app to get it to do things, then you need to think about aspects of vocal interaction. What are people, how would different types of people work with your tool? If they speak different languages, will your tool accommodate different languages? It should. What if you're speaking the same language, but people use different dialects, speak different dialects, or have different accents? How will your tool then address that? What if they have a speech impediment? What if they speak really quickly or really slowly? So you need to be thinking about how do these different kinds of variations, how will they be addressed by your tool? How do you make sure that you're being inclusive about it? And of course, you can apply the same kind of thinking to virtually any kind of AI that you're going to build. So additional ways to get at this are through collaborative design sessions. So these tend to be workshops, so they can come in different forms. Um, that will help you get at your users' circumstances, needs, and wants. You can conduct activities to identify their mental models, generate ideas for features, or identify their needs. For example, you could invite a bunch of target users to sketch up different ideas for a smart assistant, including how they would use it and what kinds of things they think it should do. They might not always tell you these things in interviews, so these kinds of creative activities can be a great way to gain insight. And it can be, also be a good opportunity to hear about things that might be concerns to them, like how much data should this product have about me? And how, do, how much do I value my privacy versus convenience? Issues that are especially important in the AI space. So as this is going on, you're focused on your users, but you're also hopefully figuring out your training data. So you're going to build an AI, and your AI has to learn on something. So even if you don't consider yourself a data person, even if you're a designer or a researcher who doesn't deal with machine learning, somebody on your team hopefully is, or at least is in charge of getting a data set. And this is where you need to be asking where is it coming from and advocating for inclusive and representative data sets. So again, you'll want to think about who are different kinds of users, um, what, are, what would they be doing, what are their circumstances, and how would that change how they'd be interacting with your product. So we can all be advocating for this, even if we're not machine learning experts. Specifically, your data set should be representing the population, including, as we said before, people who speak different languages and dialects, people with different, different kinds of voices, different genders, uh, different ages, and different abilities, among other things. So be, definitely champion that. Make sure that that's something that your team is talking about. So, at this point, hopefully, you have enough information to start drawing up some concepts for your product. And they can be pretty low fidelity concepts. They can be sketches like whatever I have going on in the background there. Um, or they can be a little bit more fleshed out. But don't wait for it to be perfect and shippable before you get feedback. Early on, you'll want to assess usefulness. And many product processes do this already. But this is especially important when you're dealing with issues of trust like you, and creepiness, like you might be in AI. You want to be asking what value does it provide. So go out and test it. Find target users and other people that you think can give you valuable feedback. And honestly, figure out, is this something that's going to be disturbing? Is it going to be something that's going to help them be useful? Um, some ways to go about this are to do a semi-structured interview that is focused on a low-fidelity prototype. Um, you can use multiple low-fidelity or mid-fidelity concepts. So again, paper sketches or something in balsamic or a black and white thing in sketch. Um, and you can propose scenarios and see how participants would respond to them. But keeping it low fidelity really allows for discussion and exploration. Another benefit of this kind of technique is that you, don't, you avoid investing too much design or engineering effort into building something that's higher fidelity and then realizing that it's a, um, it's a direction that you might want to abandon. So, Show people a couple different ideas, explore different directions with them, and ask them questions to gauge usefulness. Um, it's everything from how would you expect to use this product, what do you think you'd do with it, um, probing on specific features, and for the AI component, 
ask what, what should it know about you? Um, what would you expect it to know and how would it get that information? And not just that, but how would you give it that information? And again, what information would you be comfortable giving? Um, make sure that you are capturing unanticipated user needs and again, discomfort or creepiness or trustworthiness that might not have come out in some of those initial conversations. So at this point, hopefully, you have enough feedback on different directions or different directions you might want to explore but haven't explored yet. You might do this several times or you might do it once. But then you can go ahead and streamline, pick a direction, and iterate and refine until you get to something that is roughly approximating a product you might want to ship. Though hopefully, don't, don't ship it yet. We'll get to that. So at this point, you'll want to conduct usability tests. So you're in the evaluation stage where you're really asking, how do people use it and can they use it? So with usability testing, you're focusing more on realistic prototypes, so something that looks as close to the shippable product as possible. Again, not a hard and fast rule, but for this circumstance, this, this situation, let's say so. Um, so you'll have an interactive, clickable prototype for the, the app portion of it, and then you can use a technique called Wizard of Oz testing um, or something similar uh, for, the, for the, 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 the voice assistant piece. So in Wizard of Oz testing, your participants will be asking questions, providing input to the system in the way that they would for a real AI. So they'll ask questions of the prototype like, where can I find, how many grocery stores are nearby? Or find grocery stores near me. And then the facilitator will provide simulated output as they think the system would respond. So for example, there are three grocery stores by you. The closest one is a Safeway, or something like that. Um, and when you're doing this, you'll want to model real tasks. So specific tasks that your users would be doing, going through when they use your product. Um, and you can test for issues of usability, navigation, findability, organization. Uh, different kinds of, of things that you think might go wrong. Um, so for example, look at the wake word, look at, ask them to turn on the lights or call a friend. So whatever realistic situations that you think your, your users would be asking the AI to do. Um, you also want to look at things like how would they configure it? For example, can your system do different voices? Uh, can they speed up their, their output? Can they slow it down? Um, and then how does this experience change once you become an advanced user versus how do you orient new users to it? So there are lots of different possibilities and it will certainly depend on what you're trying to do, but you're really focusing now on making sure that it's usable. So finally, you'll want to make bias busting a regular part of your process. So many of you probably engage in some kind of QA at some point in your process. Um, but that's often for technical diligence rather than bias. So what I'm, what I'm suggesting is that we make it part, we make bias part of the normal QA process. And there are a number of tools that are starting to become explored in academia and I think are making their way into the mainstream tech industry that actually train AIs to check themselves for bias and evaluate the representativeness of their own models and algorithms. So as those become available, that's something that we can consider building into our own processes. Also continue to seek user feedback and especially around the issues of trustworthiness and creepiness um, and representativeness. Make sure that users are comfortable with the product um, at all stages, at all concepts and make sure that it's something that they can really see themselves using and feel comfortable using. And finally, you'll want to keep raising awareness. This starts with us on our product teams and our development teams, but AI, as AI becomes more mainstream, more and more of us will want to use AI and think about how it's affecting us. And as new ideas come onto the market, it's important to assess that they're interesting, that they're usable, they're viable, and that they're inclusive. So continue these dialogues and conversations, both within your teams and as you go out into the world. So in sum, representative, responsible AI incorporates people's values and concerns and uses representative data and aims to eliminate bias. And you can use your standard user research tool set in order to test yourself for that and to achieve it. 
So I think we'll take questions later, but thank you to, for listening, and I look forward to chatting with you after. <laughs>